In 2000, you guys released Wide Awake Board. Uh, this has three singles. We've been talking about American Psycho, Brand New Low, and Business. So this is now your first platinum album, top 10, another Juno nomination. Uh, this gets two Juno nominations, because not just album, but also single for American Psycho. Is it fair to say that American Psycho uh, was the band's biggest hit period of, of, of your career. And why do you think people, if so, why do you think people just love that song so much? Yeah, I would, I would say that's our biggest hit. I just think it, it, it like I say, Greg and, and Matt Hyde and I, we, we worked long and hard. I, you know, I think one of the reasons that album turned out so well is because we did a lot of pre-production. Um, we were also, RCA was, was, you know, this was our second album and the first album had not been successful in America. So it was very put up or shut up and they, they put us through the ringer. They, they wouldn't even commit to making the whole album. They made us do it in two halves. So, which was really expensive because you had to do a drum setup twice and it was frighteningly expensive. I think that record I think it costs 500,000 American dollars to make. We had, we went to sound city in LA, which was amazing. We had Joe Barisi, who was like the super Uber producer. He, he was just there as, as drum tech. He was just tuning the drums and, and helping set up the drums. We had, we had Rami from the wallflowers playing keyboards. Um, it was just a great time. We were, you know, we were living in, in, corporate apartments in LA coming to the studio every day and making music. And it was just, so yeah. And, and I, I'm very, like I said, I'm very proud of, I, I wrote a lot of the lyrics to American psycho that I thought were, you know, I was very, very happy with. And, and that, that riff actually, it, it, I, I give our David Bendith, our A and R guy, a lot of credit. He, he's the one with, but we recorded it a completely different arrangement and it was actually the wood completely done. And we edited it to, to put that guitar lick, that guitar riff at the top of the song. It was just going to start with that in retrospect was like, wow, it's terrible beginning, <laughs> but he could, he could see that. And he said, Oh, you need to do this. And we we're like, you're crazy. And then he, we somehow made that edit and it, it sounds great. Is Sound City in LA, is that the studio that uh, Dave Grohl made the movie, Sound yeah. City? Yeah. And it's like Rage Against Machine recorded their debut there. And uh, yeah, so uh, many great. Fleetwood Mac, I think. Fleetwood There's Mac. Tom Petty. Yeah, it's a, Tom Pe the, I remember the, the best the, studios. The giant live room and, and there's a grand piano and, and someone said, yeah, only Tom Petty uses that. That's fair enough. I think maybe for the album, my cheap trick heaven tonight was recorded there. Um, and it was very, it was not very glamorous. It looked its age. It was very rough looking. And that was, a, it was a lot of fun hanging out there. The, the success of the band allowed you guys to tour around the world. Were there any favorite places that you liked to visit when you went on tour? Well, around there was not around the world. We were just in North America. Um, Halifax has always been one of my favorite places to play. Uh, the people there love music so much. Um, you know, in the in the '90s, I was in this magic indie bubble. I I never heard any Salt and Pepper or, or like I can't hum a Sublime song. All I all I listened to was Sonic Youth and Pavement and Guided by Voices and Stereo Lab. And I remember one particular tour every time we'd, we'd show up for sound check and it would be offspring, keep them separated. And it'd be like, Oh, if I hear that song one more time, I'm going to kill myself. And I remember arriving at the venue in, in Halifax and stereo lab was playing. And I just went, Oh, my people. Yeah. And you know, whether the music you hear before you go on makes such a big difference. It could just make you have, have a great show and, and, the Halifax audiences were always great. Uh, I always loved playing uh, Portland and Seattle. Uh, I, New York was always amazing. Um, we played two or three times at this little room called the Mercury Lounge with amazing sound system, amazing sounding stage. Um, 
yeah we, we, those are the ones that stand out um, one of the one of the one of the gigs that stands out for me is we, because we opened for the Foo Fighters on a big U.S. tour on their second album, and we were playing uh, we were playing L.A. and I had round glasses like this, different ones. They were even more kind of dorky architect glasses at the time, and 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 we were we were first on the bill, so we were about to go on. I was setting up, and people, in the, someone in the crowd was heckling me. And I, I still marvel the, the back thinking like it didn't phase me one bit. We'd been on the road forever. And, and I just kind of looked at, looked at this guy like, oh yeah, MF, like who's on the stage right now, huh? You were battle and tested at that point. I was bad. So it, instead of like, going, oh no, I was just like, it, it empowered me to be, I had like a fun, angry show that night. You you channeled that energy. Was it just a, a Foo Fighters fan that didn't care about who the opener I don't, was? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it was it was that tour was uh, Foo Fighters and Talk Show. I don't know if you remember Talk Show. That was the Stone Temple Pilots offshoot hmm. when Scott Whalen was was in rehab and they hooked up with their high school buddy that played in a cover band. So he was the singer and and. And that that tour, we didn't hang out with the Foo Fighters much because it was mostly like really old, big, four thousand seat theaters in the U.S. And they were always set up on one side of the the, the Foo Fighters dressing room was would be on one side of the venue, and our dressing room and talk show would be on the other side. And those guys were just sweethearts, the DeLeo brothers and, and Eric the drummer. They just like, I think like. Uh, Dean DeLeo went to Guitar Center in LA to buy a pedal for Greg. So I think a pedal broke down. He's like, oh, I, I got you this boss distortion. And it's nice to hear those stories of the, the good guys in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. They were just a, a joy to be with. We have a, a fan question. This is from Amanda Luciano. Uh, she asks, what is your craziest or most memorable fan interaction? It could be sweet, funny, or crazy. Uh, uh, <laughs> fan interaction. Nobody threw their underwear or anything? I don't think so. I don't know. I was, the, I was not much of a fan interaction guy. Uh, so my, my story is kind of lame, just, you know, being at some, some weird, uh, gig in Toronto outside somewhere, like where there wasn't really a backstage area. And I, this, this woman came up to me with her daughters and said, I, I know you're the one that doesn't really like to talk to fans, but you, could you sign this for me? And I was like, yeah, sure, sure. No problem. It's so very I, considerate. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was that guy. I kind of hid from the fans. Would, would you would you say you're an introvert or that's not what it is? I, yeah, I would say I'm an introvert. Yes. OK, OK. Um, do your songs usually come together in a specific order when you're writing? So, for example, some people just write a ton of lyrics and eventually put it to music. Some guitarists are always writing music and then they put a melody to it and then eventually fit words within that melody. Or do your songs just some of them start with guitar, some with lyrics, some with vocals. Yeah, I think it's it's very varied with me. Um, some songs, um, Red, I remember Red very vividly because I had a, a, a black, uh, it was by these kind of black notebooks. And, uh, and I would just write things that hopefully I would, I would come up with a turn of phrase and I would write it down. I remember at the bottom of the page on the left, I had written, saw you looking for a light face painted cigarette white. And I wrote that down. I closed the book. And then however many days later, I looked at that and was like, Oh, that's, that's pretty good. And then I think the rest came pretty fast. Um, uh, the first song on Priddle Concern, Union of Concerned Scientists, I was uh, I was watching the CBC and there was an interview with uh, the 
uh, the president of the Union of Concerned Scientists, and his name was Dr. Robert Pollard. And Robert Pollard is the singer from Guided by Voices, one of my favorite bands. So I, I was like, oh, yeah, Union of Concerned Scientists. That's good. I wrote the entire lyrics in about three minutes. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, that's really good. But I do not know how to put this to music. And then months later, I was like, oh, I could do this. Uh, other times I, I do, uh, other times I do uh, the complete opposite approach. Sometimes I will write an entire song with no lyrics and no melody and I'll wait for like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with that later. I've done that on two or three of these pointless songs. It was like, okay, I'll just, uh, I've, I've got something good here. It'll, it'll come to me. Do you still have some of those that you're still waiting <laughs> where this, yeah. the music's yeah. done and you're just waiting? <laughs> yeah, there's two or three pointless songs that I'm like, you know, this is a good backing track. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have, have you ever had uh, songs come to you so easily that you just felt like the conduit? You just felt like the medium Absolutely. that it was passing through. So you, you might call it, I don't know, you know, God gives you a song or the infinite yeah. intelligence or source or however you want to say it. Yeah, I think... I think any any songwriter that has that happen to them, they're they're always going to be describe themselves as an agnostic and not an atheist because it's something. Uh, uh, Christ is on the lawn from maybe it's me. I I remember three in the morning. I woke up my ex wife like you have to hear this right now because it just, boom, it came to be. And I think I wrote the whole song in 20 minutes or something. Those are, you know, when, like you mentioned, you, you went a few years with some writer's block. So when you get those gifts, you must really appreciate them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, like I say, there, there hasn't been those kind of songs since those days. Now I, I, I toil and sweat, but 